I'm here with Dr. Darren Kando, who's one of the world's leading creatine researchers. So Dr. Kando, tell me this soup to nuts, like the basics of creatine, like who needs it, right. who's gonna benefit from it, who wouldn't benefit from it. Today's video is sponsored by Element, L-M-N-T. I'm a fan of their citrus salt, it's super refreshing. They have their grapefruit salt, which is a delicious flavor. They have their watermelon salt, a bunch of different flavors. So that link gets you a free variety pack with any purchase. So when you purchase any kind of electrolytes from Element, you get a free variety pack when you use that link down below. And that has that perfect combination, it has 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 potassium, 60 magnesium, which is why I use it. It's the perfect ratio that I like specifically for me. That way I can use a full packet if I'm fasted, I'll use a half packet if I'm not fasted, and then drink the other half a little bit later on throughout the course of the day. So it's drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Whether you are fasted or not, it's a super low or zero calorie way to get some flavor and to kind of kill your appetite as well. So check them out. That link is down below in the top line of the description. Yeah, a great starting point. So creatine is naturally made in our body, primarily in the liver, but a lot of people don't know it's actually made in the brain as well. Um, so creatine, we naturally produce it. We can get it in our diet from red meat and seafood, about one to three grams a day. Um, but that could be an issue if you're a vegan, a vegetarian, or someone who emphasizes a plant-based diet. Uh, but anyway, it's basically the energy currency of our cell. It helps maintain something called adenosine triphosphate, and we use it for activities of daily living, but we primarily use it during exercise, and weightlifting seems to be at the forefront. So the theory is if you have more creatine in the muscle primarily, you can do more exercise volume, you can run longer, potentially do more repetitions and lift more weight. And then over time you get bigger, stronger, faster. So that was kind of the evolution and the, the, where creatine really got its legs. Uh, and that was in the late 1990s. And now it's taken off the whole, have a whole number of clinical and health beneficial effects. Yeah, because I mean, when I first kind of learned mm -hmm. about creatine, it was simply to build muscle. And that's all people really looked at. And then as I kind of became more well-versed and I realized, okay, mm -hmm. well, this is something that's more of an energy building supplement versus a muscle building supplement. But there are some components of it outside of just giving you more energy that mm -hmm. may lead to more muscle as well, right? That's correct. So the theory is if, you ha if the cell has more energy, it can potentially do more work. So there's a lot of things besides just having more muscle that it can lead to. There's many things called growth factors or, or transcription factors within the muscle cell itself that can help build bigger and stronger muscles. But the biggest one I think a lot of us are aware of that it improves muscle strength. So a lot of individuals now are well versed that an increase in muscle strength is important. That also leads to an increase in muscle endurance as well as power. And then you look at the other parts of the body, there's now good evidence that it can improve aspects of bone health. And then I'm sure later on, we'll talk about the importance and the beneficial effects it has on the brain. So it's come between just a, a skeletal muscle uh, a supplement to a whole body supplement. And it's not just for males, females respond very favorably as well. But overall, it seems to have some really, really therapeutic and sport or exercise beneficial effects. So let's uh, kind of bucket this for a second. If we have, let's say we're talking about the strength training mm -hmm. aspect, and this doesn't need to be for meatheads, it can be for anyone sure, that's yeah. just resistance training. You know, we have obviously these pretty defined segments in that we look at resistance training. Like you've got, okay, you've got the one to three rep range where most people think, okay, this is where creatine's helping out, yep. right? Or, or maybe even less than that, maybe a half a rep to one rep, right? Then you have this sort of eight to 12 rep, what we call the hypertrophy range, where people try to build muscle. Then you've got this higher, more uh, you know, aerobic range. Mm -hmm. I think there's some misnomers out mm -hmm. there and I'd like to clear them up that, I mean, creatine is only directly gonna help a power lifter that's working in the one to three rep range but there's some pretty strong evidence that suggests that it can help you as far as recovery is concerned between different rep ranges as well, right? That's correct. It will help across the entire repetition uh, spectrum. So anywhere from power to one to three, hypertrophy phase, anywhere between three to 12 or even more, uh, Stu Phillips has shown light load now actually can be effective. So it doesn't really matter the number of repetitions, but actually there's evidence across the entire spectrum that creatine and resistance training can actually improve measures of muscle mass, strength, endurance, as well as power, the ability to move a force very powerfully. So I think it has application for anybody engaged in weight training, resistance training, or plyometric training. Yeah. So how exactly, just in a very simple mm -hmm. way, does it help in the hypertrophy range? Does it aid in the recovery, like the micro recovery between sets? Right. Or 
Yeah, so there's two schools of thought. It has anabolic properties, so it increases things called satellite cells and transcription factors, and people maybe have heard of insulin-like growth factors. So all those things come together to help create an anabolic environment. What creatine doesn't do is increase the rates of protein synthesis directly. So unlike whey protein or casein, which does, creatine sort of has to do it uh, sort of in a multifactorial perspective. But there's really good evidence on the flip side, it has anti-catabolic effects. Mm -hmm. So when we think of uh, anti-catabolic, Catabolic, think of people at home, Advil, Tylenol, so these are anti-inflammatory. Creatine has huge anti-inflammatory properties, so it definitely will increase recovery post-exercise. That could allow the athlete to exercise more frequently in a program, get back on the playing field more optimally. After some of your long runs, that might allow you to recover and get back in the gym the next day. So it decreases things called cytokines, which are markers of inflammation. It also has anti-catabolic effects to muscle protein. So this is something a lot of people are, are not really familiar with but when you take creatine it decreases the breakdown of your muscle and it's primarily in males we're not sure why we don't see the evidence in, in females it might have to do with estrogen but we're not sure but males seem to have a reduction in muscle protein breakdown more than females in the presence of creatine so you take an anabolic building up and then a reduction in breakdown and that's probably one of the main reasons people who take creatine seem to get bigger stronger faster can recover more and if you improve your body remember we'll talk about decreasing in body fat maybe the muscle mass going up increases metabolic rate thermogenesis and that can have huge implications for fat loss. And with the obesity and type 2 diabetic uh, epidemic that we're facing worldwide, this could have huge implications uh, from a lifestyle intervention. That's so wild because when you think of creatine, you think mm -hmm. of just the direct approach. Yes. Okay, I'm getting energy. This is great. But you don't yeah. really think about the recovery aspect That's of right. it. And something we talk about on this channel all the time is just that balance of muscle protein breakdown, muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the basics of it. I mean, it's if you're, you're breaking down more than you're synthesizing, mm -hmm. you're going to lose muscle. That's yeah. plain and simple. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously this would come into play with endurance work as well, potentially, like having that recovery in between longer sessions, things like that. Yeah, there was a myth for probably two decades that creatine was only good for people in, in the weight room based on the principles of some of his actions. And we sort of sort of looked at the uh, all the literature this year and put out a good review on some of the applications for creatine and sport and, and endurance uh, performance. And it has applications for everything from swimming to soccer to cycling to uh, um, triathlon use. And it's looked at in two favors. It can help recover from those type of sporting events, or it may allow you to spare muscle glycogen, which is one of the main causes of fatigue later on in an exercise session, or decrease the reliance on beta oxidation, which produces a lot of energy, but it's very slow. So some people needing to sprint across the finish line or whichever in the presence of creatine that theoretically could have some advantageous effects. So really, all athletes, doesn't matter your domain, endurance, resistance, or combination, CrossFitters come to mind. This is something that should be looked at at least as an adjunct to your normal training. Now, how quickly can you burn through your creatine stores? Excellent question. You can burn through them in muscle fairly quickly. Um, and when you do so with just say a, a set of 10 repetitions, your uh, intramuscular creatine stores will come down. But here's the key, if you have more creatine in the muscle, that will recover quicker in between sets, and that'll allow you to maybe do more repetitions in your second, third, and fourth set. And we actually just did a study two years ago where we had individuals drink creatine during their workout sessions instead of what's typically consumed branched chain amino acids. They took a small sip of creatine after every set, uh, 18 sets whole body, and, they, and the individuals on creatine got huge increases in strength and endurance compared to placebo. So it just shows that you can consume creatine during your workout and it may offset some of the detriments in energy status or cause an anabolic effect. And there doesn't seem to be any kind of insulin spike or anything that would come if you were just consuming straight monohydrate. <laughs> You know, because I look at people yep. that people that train fasted, for example, yes. like I'm a big fasted trainer. Mm -hmm. I love training in that fashion. And sometimes I think, OK, well, I don't really want to have, you know, peri-workout or intra-workout carbohydrates, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a multitude of reasons. I, I do like them in different cases, but mm -hmm. a lot of times I don't. And it makes me wonder, I'm like, wow, I wonder if as like an immediate ergogenic aid, if I could sip on creatine mm -hmm. straight unflavored monohydrate in water. Mm -hmm. And if it wouldn't break a fast, so to speak, I mean, there's no insulin spike or anything that you guys have seen with research? Not from creatine itself, although it is made of three amino acids. But the nice thing with creatine, it opens the doorways to your muscle. They're called GLUT4 transport proteins, mm -hmm. very popular in type 2 diabetes. 
and it actually allows more glucose disposal into the muscle. So therefore, if glucose gets in quicker, you can go through processes of carbohydrate metabolism, which give you the fastest rates of ATP. And that's the theory with uh, some of the uh, hypochloric or facet training with creatine. Interesting. So, and it can potentially increase sort of the insulin independent glucose uptake as well. That's correct. You reduce reliance and then for you, maybe you burn more body fat over time. That's so cool. That yeah, seriously is yeah. cool. Yeah, because I mean, I'm a big fan of, you know, if I am going to have mm -hmm. carbs intra workout, a yes. lot of times it's a little bit of watermelon or something that's just a yes. fast absorbing. Yeah. And, I, and I, I like it because at that point in time, I feel like I'm granted some amnesty where mm -hmm. it's just like I'm not requiring insulin to really get it in. Correct. It sounds, wow, that's really, yeah. really cool. And the other big thing is muscle contractions will allow creatine into the muscle itself. So when you're exercising, that's ha allowing the process there as well. So um, I am very similar to you. I drink creatine during my workout uh, just in water and I've had no adverse effects of anything. I find it actually helps from a beneficial perspective. That's super cool. So, okay, let's pivot for just a little bit. Okay. What about maybe, you know, we'll do a longer topic specific on potential body fat reduction, but what yeah. about say, you know, the person that's overweight, that's mm -hmm. not, not jumping into the gym, doing anything crazy yet. They're just trying to get moving. Right. Uh, what are the advantages for creatine in terms of creatine for someone like that? Someone that's maybe, maybe 40 years old, 50 right. years old, they're, you know, 50, 60 pounds overweight and they, right. just, they just need a leg up. Yeah. So that's a really important from a global health perspective. So creatine really only will work in combination with exercise. So if the individual is willing to do activities of daily living or engage in some types of exercise, creatine may have some small favorable effects. Those effects get larger once the individual will exercise. But from someone who's overweight and giving creatine independently of exercise, they may only get some cognitive or uh, brain beneficial effects. Um, they may not get any muscle or bone beneficial effects. Um, and when we get to the fat discussion, we'll probably look at the effects of exercise in combination. So I think at the, the totality of the evidence would suggest if an individual is just sedentary or just trying to get back into the gym, uh, creatine can have some therapeutic uh, effects from a cognitive or brain health perspective. Um, but once they get into the routine, that's when creatine can unlock its magic and potentially have some muscle, fat, and bone benefits. Interesting. So, I mean, is it safe to say that it's kind of a demand-driven supplement? I mean, it's something that's like if the demand's not there, it's... That's 100%. Okay. I use that analogy in my class all the time. Creatine is not an anabolic steroid. You need to do some work to sort of unlock its potential. Um, but there's a few studies I've shown creatine independent of exercise can have some therapeutic effects uh, for pregnancy to some type of uh, uh, neurological diseases such as muscular dystrophy. Um, and then we get into all the population, sleep deprivation, students, uh, people climbing hypoxia. Creatine really seems to work from a cognitive perspective when the brain is stressed. Uh, and in today's society, post COVID, I think a lot of people have depression, anxiety, or symptoms of that. And that's where creatine is sort of moving a bit, um, but it has a lot of applications from a health, sport, and of course, uh, uh, clinical perspective. Well, I mean, in that case, it is, there is a demand. People just mm -hmm. aren't necessarily aware of the that's demand, correct. right? It's yeah. like, yeah. we're aware of conscious demand when yeah. we go into the gym, we think, oh, well, creatine is not gonna work for me because they don't work out. Yeah, but you're stressed out. There's a mental demand going yeah. on there or you're pregnant yeah. and there's all kinds of different yeah. demand happening. That's correct. And there's so much myths and misconceptions about creatine, especially around the safety. Um, people think it's too good to be true. There must be some harmful effects. And uh, we've looked at so many studies, liver, kidney, everything, and there's been no adverse effects, even up to two years at very high dosages. Uh, and it probably makes sense because we're producing that molecule in the body. Just, it's like no different than taking in protein or carbohydrates, why would that cause any adverse effects if taken in a normal range, uh, creatine falls in that exact same pattern. What kind of high dosing have, has it been tested out? Yeah, we just sort of published a large study this year in postmenopausal females. And this is a unique population because as we get older, kidney and liver function starts to go down usually around the fourth decade or even longer. And these individuals were 50 and above, uh, postmenopausal for two years. And we gave them almost 11 grams of creatine monohydrate a day for two straight years. We measured liver and kidney enzymes to, to look at safety, and there was no greater effects compared to placebo. So it's the longest trial ever to look at a high dose of creatine in combination with exercise in, in a population that is susceptible some, to deterioration in, in organ health, and there was no um, adverse effects. Um, so we're very confident in that creatine within normal recommendations of loading um, and dosages are effective and safe. So when we look at the brain, mm -hmm. what, uh, what is happening in the brain? Because that's where things are hot right now. And, right. and we'll do a full separate topic on this because there's okay. a lot of detail that yeah. could go. But sort of 
in an overarching perspective, is it just energy demand in the brain or is it ROS? What is it that yeah. it's helping with in the brain? Yeah, the poor brain never got any press in, in for about three decades on uh, creatine. And all of a sudden, everybody said, my brain and mental health becomes way more important uh, than my physical health, so to speak. Um, and then when we look at all the data, the, cre the brain metabolizes about 20% of our daily energy. So when you're consuming all the food you're eating, the brain is using about 20% of that. And lo and behold, when we look at uh, research studies, when people take creatine supplementation, you can improve the content of the brain by about 6%. Now that sounds like a lot, but compare that to muscle, which is between 20 and 40%, and then you're wondering what's the difference. Well, our muscle doesn't make creatine. It likes to suck it up from the bloodstream as soon as it enters uh, uh, into the body. The brain says we have a blood-brain barrier. We don't want a lot of things coming in that we don't really uh, are aware of. Um, so creatine can get in the brain, but it's very slow. It has to go through a lot of obstacles. And the other cool thing with the brain is that it makes its own brain creatine content. So I think for a long period of time, we were giving people uh, creatine, but we never considered the brain because it always, in theory, went to uh, uh, your, your muscle, which 95% does, but some does go to the brain. And then when you look at people with inborn creatine deficiencies where they don't synthesize creatine in the brain, uh, primarily in children, uh, depression, anxiety, everything that's sort of exploded in the last decade, we're now seeing creatine can get into the brain and offset some of those negative effects of depression, anxiety, uh, and also concussion is a huge one. We're starting to see some data out of the UK where children that have experienced uh, concussion were immediately randomized to creatine or placebo. And those children, when they were put on a higher dose of creatine, 0 0.4 grams per kilogram, so if they were 70 kilograms, they're only getting um, basically about uh, 30 grams of creatine per day, um, they were actually seeing huge beneficial effects. And again, there's no safety um, concerns, so it seemed to have some beneficial effects for post-exercise or post-concussion uh, recovery. Wow, so do you, is the effect on the brain mm -hmm. the same reason why there seems to be a beneficial effect on sleep? Is it, is it, or is it more so recovery in the body or is it yeah. happening in the brain? Yeah, we see the best evidence when the brain is stressed. So sleep deprivation, people working um, overnight, getting uh, circadian rhythms are, are, are all uh, mixed up. So whenever the brain is stressed, uh, and we do some laboratory tests where we stress the, the healthy individual from a mental or cognitive standpoint, and they really seem to improve with memory, cognitive tasks, and, and sort of motor control. Uh, when the brain is not stressed, and primarily in young individuals, we don't see any improvements, probably because the brain is, is, is healthy and adaptable. But in older adults especially, and during times of sleep, deprivation or hypoxia we just talked about before we started this about climbing mountains and stuff it seems to have some effect by decreasing inflammation so when the re reduction in barometric pressure at altitude you're having less barometric pressure pu pushing oxygen in well that makes sense it's more anaerobic creatine sort of takes over and, and anytime we're stressed or jet lagged the brain you, you feel that foggy effect that's where creatine really seems to have an wow. effect so when I'm flying to Europe I will take way more creatine than normal for a few days to hopefully offset the effects of uh, sleep deprivation or, or the fogginess that a lot of people uh, suffer. For students, exams are coming up, the, the huge issues staying up all night studying. I think creatine has potential applications, but when you look at all the data, older adults and, and think of individuals prone to dementia, Alzheimer's and things like that, um, I think in the next 10 or 20 years, you're gonna see a huge explosion from the mental health aspects of creatine. Yeah, I agree. Now, yeah. with, with dosing in regards mm -hmm. to that, how quickly can you sort of react? Like, and can you titrate the dose sort of accordingly? You know, you say, okay, shoot, I just got in a, a fight with my girlfriend or, you know, and I'm You're super right. stressed yeah. out. It's yeah. like, can you pop some creatine right. right then and there and offset it? Or is there a lag? Like if you notice, okay, I'm going through a period, I've been sleep deprived for two or three days, I mm -hmm. haven't been sleeping well. Is it a cumulative thing? Is it acute? Is it a little bit of both? It's a huge distinction. So caffeine is almost immediate. 60 minutes in your bloodstream, everybody's happy. Creatine doesn't work like that, unfortunately. It has to accumulate. But the, all the research that's coming out suggests that the muscle, bone, and brain may require totally different dosages. So we've gotten a little complacent, almost a sense of laziness, because we used to just recommend a certain dosage for muscle. But now there's really good evidence that there's people out there susceptible to bone loss, primarily females for osteoporosis, frailty, and people with cancer for caxia. They require a lot more. And then the brain actually might require more and way longer periods of time to accumulate. Remember, the blood-brain barrier says we're limiting what's getting in. So I, when I look at all the data, I recommend at least 10 grams a day from a whole body perspective. 
But if you say, hey, I don't really care about my bone or brain, I'm just looking for muscle, three to five grams a day, every day for the rest of your life, I think is adequate. Uh, but we're seeing from a bone health perspective, the lowest dose shown ever in combination with exercise was eight grams. And then from the brain, when you take out studies that are, are in uh, individuals with depression or anxiety on medication, the dose on average is about 20 grams a day for four months or longer. Wow. So it's interesting when you look at different areas of the body while you're taking it, I think 10 grams on average, uh, and it's never been shown, but if you look at all the averages, 10 grams a day from a whole body perspective seems to be a very viable option. And you don't have to take it all at once. You can divide it up into multiple dosages. If you want, you can take 10 one gram dosages. You can take a couple grams with breakfast, lunch, dinner, whichever you want. Um, but again, it, it, there's no evidence to suggest that that's a hindering effect. If anything, you wanna take probably more than having two less. Okay. Now. We'll do a completely separate topic on just potential side effects. Mm -hmm. But the big one that I want to address yep. that I'm sure people are like, I don't want to take 10 grams per day because right. I'm going to like bloat up and I'm going <laughs> to exactly. retain a bunch of water. Yep. Um, can you explain a like why that potentially happens mm -hmm. and b like why it's not necessarily a concern? Yeah. So creatine is called is an osmotic compound. So you think of water. Uh, our bloodstream is primarily water. So when creatine enters the bloodstream, it's kind of unique. It likes to drag sodium with it to your muscle. And when you have sodium or salt coming into the muscle, it has to drag water to balance out the equilibrium. So a lot of times when you take creatine, you have water coming from your blood into the muscle. So a lot of people say, gee, in the first three or four days, I notice I've gotten heavier or my clothes are, are fitting a little bit tighter or I feel a little bit bloated. And I say, that's 100% normal. Your body will adapt over time. Um, but then people say, I don't want to gain weight or get bloated. And I say an easy way to do uh, or decrease the risk of bloating or, or retention, I guess it is from water, is to just take smaller, more frequent dosages. That way it won't cause the bolus or, or the super acute effect of water retention. But I also high five to people who say, hey, I did get water retention because then you are a responder. That mm. means you have the genetics and capability that your muscles are going to really respond to creatine. Um, and I high five these people and say, you should expect some beneficial effects, primarily strength. Yeah. Yeah. And I know there was a lot of, you know, supplements back in the day mm -hmm. that had, you know, were like, I remember, actually, I shouldn't even name brands, but I remember, they, okay. you know, they would have, uh, you know, creatine plus a bunch of sodium plus mm -hmm. a bunch of glucose. And, you know, people would take that yep. and they'd get puffy. I'm like, well, hey you know, consider the other two major ingredients that are in there. Right. You've got, you know, 65 grams mm -hmm. of glucose and you have a thousand milligrams of sodium coming That's in, right. like factor in that yes. that could be why you're retaining yeah. water. And you don't see a lot of those sub or, uh, supplements anymore, especially ones with high amounts of sugar, because yeah. from a health perspective, a lot of people know the, the contraindications of sugar, but from an athletic perspective, carbohydrates can be very beneficial. Uh, and then Roger Harrison, 1992, did a really good study where he showed simply exercising will stimulate these doorways into the muscle to allow creatine in. So instead of all the carbohydrate or other derivatives, why not exercise and then take creatine maybe after you work out or even before, and that seems to upregulate into the muscle. Uh, insulin is a very effective way to do that, but a lot of people are sensitive to uh, carbohydrate, sugar, or if you have diabetes, uh, that's a, a major factor. So I think exercise and protein will do the exact same thing, and you get a lot more benefits by combining creatine and protein than creatine and carbohydrate. Uh, but I think prior exercise is one of the most viable factors. So that's why I always take one of my boluses right after exercise. Yep. Uh, blood flow is upregulated. These creatine transporters that allow things into the body or into the muscle primarily are stimulated. Um, so post-exercise creatine is a very viable uh, choice. But the cool thing is the timing of creatine in general is irrelevant. And we can probably talk about that as well. Is there a specific time you have to get in uh, very similar to caffeine? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I typically take my creatine mm -hmm. like with a whey protein shake. So I'm getting the insulinogenic effect yes. from the whey. And you know, this is because people don't realize that whey is extremely insulinogenic. Yes, it is, yeah. So I mean, it's one of the better ways to kind of transport. So yeah. that's usually my, my allocation. Then I take a couple more grams at night. So I okay. usually do for me, like, you know, four to six grams. Mm -hmm. I have like these little gummies. I usually yes. do like yep. individual yep. so I can like dose them appropriately. Right. So right. sometimes I'll take one or two gummies during my workout. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll take, you know, four to six posts and then I'll usually take two before bed. Right. So I do kind of space it out. And I probably noticed maybe a half pound of water retention, right. you know, at, mm -hmm. at the most. Yes. And even that seemed to settle down. And I will take that half pound, mm -hmm. especially considering it's intracellular. Right. I don't feel like I'm bloated or right. I don't look puffy. Right. I just gained the weight, which is probably right. muscle or, you know, intracellular That's water. Right. Yeah. Um, 
Another one that I just want to touch on real quick mm -hmm. is some people are concerned about this DHT conversion and, and, and hair loss. And I know that comes from <laughs> like some really weak data that was yeah. a while back, but you know, maybe I'm mistaken. I mean, is there anything to worry about there? I know I'm the worst person to ask this, obviously, when you look <laughs> at my head. So the study, it's, it, you know, it's probably the most popular myth in the world. Uh, it'd be no different than protein killing your kidneys. It was the one study in rugby players that you're referring to, and these young athletes were exercising at a very high volume and DHT is a precursor for testosterone conversion and DHT has been linked to hair follicle loss and, and baldness. And of course, when I talk about it, people say, well, you're bald, so you creatine <laughs> must, must cause baldness and most creatine researchers are actually so. But the funny thing is when they took the high dose of creatine, um, their DHT levels went up. But remember, whenever, whenever we go to a doctor and we get a blood requisition panel and, and an annual physical, They'll tell you a, a range, or your number for cholesterol or triglycerides, but then right beside it, there's a range. Mm -hmm. There's a healthy range where you fall in the population. And yes, DHT, which is a hormone, and hormones go up all the time. It did go up when these uh, young males were on creatine compared to placebo, but it was still fell within the healthy range. And then you read a little bit further into the, the study and, oh, by the way, exercise, resistance training will increase this as well. So there was a lot of variables in that study. Not once did they measure hair follicle loss, thinning or baldness. So we can conclude there's no evidence currently that creatine causes hair loss. I will sort of keep going. I've assessed over a thousand individuals, males and females from 18 all the way up to about 90 years of age. Not a single person has ever come to me and said, by the way, I feel like my hair is thinning or it's falling out from whatever you're giving me. So I'm pretty confident, and people would tell me, obviously that would be one of the biggest things that they would notice, there's no evidence to suggest it, it does. Um, it's never been assessed. I believe Grant Tinsley from Texas was going to look at this, and I'm not sure if, 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 it's, if it's currently going on, but we need to actually measure the follicle and, and measure the hair loss over time. So as it currently stands, no, there's yeah. not that one study, but that will still be the number one question people get. Yeah, and it's still gonna pop up. And they look at me and it's nothing they can say to it. <laughs> Ah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Save money on haircuts, I guess. So the last thing you know, that I want to address on this video yeah. is the uh, a loading phase. Yes. Uh, that's another sort of where people banter back and forth. Is a loading phase required? Is right. it not? So loading phase is about 20 grams a day for about five to seven days. And that's sort of got it, its uh, momentum uh, in the late 1990s where they showed many times that was a very viable way to saturate the muscle. Uh, the problem with the loading phase, although it saturates the muscle with creatine, which could lead to an increase in repetitions and volume, that's where you get a lot of the adverse effects, GI tract irritation and, and bloating, because you're t now taking about five to uh, maybe 10 times more than what we're naturally producing in the body. So you're probably gonna have an adverse effect. So the creatine loading phase is very effective, but it can cause some of those uh, um, negative uh, consequences. Uh, you definitely don't need to load creatine if you don't want to do the loading phase, which is primarily for athletes that really need a rapid, acute uh, um, effect. Um, there's evidence that shows as low as three grams a day, every day for uh, over a month will saturate your muscles the exact same way. So I think if an athlete says, I need a really quick fist, uh, fix, I got a big game coming up or a championship and it's in two weeks, creatine loading could be very viable as long as weight gain or water retention um, isn't a factor. But for the average person just interested in this, taking it for the health and fitness benefits, you can go as low, low as three grams a day. Uh, and probably after it's saturated, you can go down to two grams a day. It might be the lowest threshold. And that would be one quarter of a teaspoon or two gummies in, in this case. And you can take that every day for the rest of your life. You don't need to cycle creatine. You can stay on this. Um, um, so that's something that's interesting as well. But if you do cycle it, it takes about 30 days for those benefits to come back to baseline. Beautiful. Well, uh, Dr. Kando, where can everyone find you, man? Well, the easiest probably be on Instagram, okay. at Dr. Darren Kando. And if you have any questions, more than happy to answer uh, any questions with that. But uh, awesome. thanks. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, man. Well, as always, keep it locked in here on the channel. And thanks, my man. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. thanks.